Moving on to part H here, we need to verify that J in reference to frame 3 transforms into J in reference 0. Both of these J uh, we found earlier in earlier steps. So both of them should transfer transform from one to another. And we want to show and prove that we can transform these from one to another. So first thing we need to do is we need to assemble a transformation matrix that consists of a rotation at the top left corner, that's R03, and the same rotation R03 in the lower right corner. And then we'll have a 3x3 three three matrix of zeros in the top right corner, and a 3x3 three three matrix of zeros in the lower left corner as well. So that would give me a 6x6 six six, uh, transformation matrix. And if I multiply that by J in reference to frame 3, that would give me J in reference to frame 0. Okay, so here I'm multiplying 6 by 6 times 6 by 3, and I'm getting 6 by 3 uh, Jacobian. Now, if we plug these in, I have here R03, and we bring this directly from the transformation matrix T03, and the same one here, R03. And here I have my 3 by 3 zeros and 3 by 3 zeros. So I multiply this by the Jacobian in reference to frame 3 that I found in earlier steps. Okay, so we found this using velocity propagation method, and we found it again using a force and moment propagation method. If I do this multiplication, I'll come up with this matrix from these two uh, matrices. So that would represent J in reference to frame 0, and I would need to compare this to the J in reference to frame 0 that I found through uh, direct differentiation method. Okay, so obviously this does not look like it if you return back to the slide when we did the uh, direct differentiation method. And the reason for this is we have some elements here that can be simplified. <clears throat> so if we simplify this, for example, we have sine square plus cosine square of theta 2. <clears throat> so if we do this uh, theta 2 sine square plus cosine square simplification, we get 1 right here. And again, if we look here at this element, the first element, we have sine square of theta 2 and cosine square of theta 2. Both of them are pre-multiplied by negative LC1 right here. So if we, if we take L negative LC1 as a common factor, then we can get S1, S2 square and C2 square uh, added together, and that would give me 1. And what's left is negative LC1, which is right here. Okay? And for the second term here, it stays the same. So that's plus D3, S1, S2. All right. And then for the second row in this element, again, we have sine theta 2 square and cosine theta 2 square. So that would be uh, 1 if we add them together. And the common uh, factor between them, between them is negative L, S1. So that would be negative L, S1 right here. And then this stays the same, negative D3, C1, S2, and we have it right here. Okay, so now this looks like the Jacobian that we have, uh, we brought from the step, uh, step F that we had before. Part I here, extract a square Jacobian. So we need to extract a square Jacobian from the non-square Jacobian. Uh, if you recall from previous steps, we had the non-square Jacobian here. Uh, this was in reference to frame zero. So we had this uh, Jacobian 6 by 3, uh, and we need to extract a square Jacobian that's a 3 by 3. And for that, you know, that particular example, uh, it specifically specified that I need to represent x dot, y dot, and z dot, which are right here. So if this requirement is already specified, that means it's a no-brainer. I'm just going to choose the first three rows. But if it's not specified, then I have more choices to choose uh, three out of these six uh, variables and the corresponding row for each one of these. Okay, so for a square Jacobian, I'm going to choose x dot, y dot, and z dot as required by the example, and that means I'm taking only the first three by three elements of the Jacobian that represents x dot, y dot, and z dot. So I put them here, and this would be the Jacobian, the square Jacobian in reference to frame zero. And it just happened to be also the linear Jacobian in reference to frame zero. Okay, so that would be my Jacobian uh, that can be invertible. And as you can see here, this is a, no, it has no permanent singularity because none of these 
uh, columns have all zero elements okay if we have an all zero elements in any of these columns that means we have a permanent singularity and this is not the case here so we know that our Jacobian has no permanent singularity for this step I need to verify that J is invertible for the giving initial joint values and then I need to find also the initial transformation matrix using the initial joint values that are given uh, in the example so the first thing I want to make sure is I want to make sure that I convert all the degrees to radians so that I can be consistent in my units uh, in this example I'm using radians so I'm going to convert these initial Q values that are given as negative 45 degrees negative 22.5 degrees and 8 units this is a, a length unit uh, and I need to convert the first two elements that are uh, in degrees into radians which is what I put here so this negative 45 degree uh, angle is equivalent to this much radians and this negative 22.5 angle degree angle is equivalent to this much in radians okay and since the 8 here is the length unit and it's a length unit here so I don't need to convert this into anything for the prismatic joint value now here I'm going to put the J for the initial so J that I have in reference to frame 0 I already found this in previous steps and what I need to do is I need to plug the values for the initial uh, joint values Q initial uh, this is theta 1 and this is theta 2 and this is D3 and I need to plug them into what we have here okay and we are given that L the length is equal to 3 so I have all the variables here and the constants that I need to evaluate this Jacobian for the initial uh, joint values okay so I plug these in here and then I get these values and these numbers plugged in if I evaluate this I get the J 0 for the initial uh, joint values right here okay so this would be the Jacobian initial Jacobian and remember Jacobian always changes as as angles or joint values change uh, so for the given joint values initial joint values here this will be my J if the joint values change then J will change as well okay now if I want to find out if this is invertible or not I need to find the determinant of the Jacobian and here for the determinant of the Jacobian uh, I find it to be negative 24.49 which is a non-zero so since it's not zero that means J is invertible if I got zero here that means J is not invertible so in this case I got a non-zero answer which means that J is invertible okay so in this case I need to find the transformation matrix when I substitute for the initial uh, joint values and again I use T03 that we found earlier in earlier steps and I substitute all the angles uh, theta 1 and theta 2 and D3 uh, with the values that we have right here and of course the constant L is also given as 3 in this uh, problem so if I substitute all of these then I get my initial transformation matrix which is this uh, substitution right here and if we uh, calculate these then we're going to come to the final answer which is the, tra the initial transformation matrix when we have uh, our joints at the initial joint values for this step here I need to find the Cartesian velocities at the end of factor and then find uh, the value of the joints for the second step so uh, let's start one at a time here for the Cartesian velocities at the end of factor by now we already have the initial transformation matrix and the desired transformation matrix so we can use these initial and desired transformation matrices and the time allowed for us to go from initial to desired to find out what are the Cartesian velocities needed uh, to go along that trajectory and then afterwards uh, we can use inverse kinematics using Jacobian inverse to find Q dot and then from there we can find the value of Q for the second step and the number of steps are given in this example and the total time to travel from initial to desired uh, location is also given so let's start with the Cartesian velocities which includes x dot y dot and z dot okay and to find the velocities basically we just have to deduct uh, the initial x from the desired x 
and divide by the time and again deduct initial y from desired y divided by time and deduct initial z from the final z and divide by the time. Since the time given here is 5 seconds and I already have the initial and final x, y, and z or initial and desired x, y, z uh, from transformation matrices, uh, initial and desired. Uh, that would be the fourth column in these transformation matrices. So I plug them in here and then when I uh, evaluate this I get these numbers which represent the Cartesian velocities of the end effector to go from the initial transformation matrix to the desired transformation matrix in five seconds. Okay, so the units for this will be units per second. All right, now uh, once we found the velocities here, we can use that information to find the joint velocities using the inverse of the Jacobian. Just a reminder here, this is the general uh, kinematic equation. Uh, Cartesian velocities in reference to frame zero equals to the Jacobian in reference to frame zero times joint velocities that we have for the robot. Okay, so if we need to find joint velocities and we already have Cartesian velocities that we found here, then we can invert the Jacobian and uh, make the equation in this arrangement where joint velocities equal to the inverse of the Jacobian in reference to frame zero multiplied by the Cartesian velocities in reference to frame zero. All right, so uh, Q dot initial, which consists of course of our three joint rates, which are theta one dot, theta two dot, and D three dot. And then we already have the initial Jacobian in reference to frame zero. We found this in the previous step. So what we need to do is we need to put it here, plug it in here and get the inverse of it. And then multiply this by the initial uh, not the initial, the joint velo the Cartesian velocities in, refer in reference to frame zero, which we already found in right here. Okay, so we plug these in here, and after inversion of the Jacobian and multiplication by this vector, then we can find uh, the initial uh, joint values in units per second. Now, why did we call this initial? And the reason for this is because Again, Q dot, which are the joint velocities, change at every time step or every time we change the joint values. And the reason for this, of course, because the Jacobian changes at every time step or every joint values. Okay, so if this, if this, if this changes, that means these will also change. So that's why we call this Q dot initial. All right, so now that we got Q dot initial, we can assemble our equation here. So to find Q, Q initial plus one, so these are the joint values, not, jo not joint velocities, joint values uh, for the step, the se second step, uh, that means we need to uh, add the initial Q values plus Q dot initial times delta T, okay? So we already have Q initial that we found uh, or we, we are given earlier. And then Q dot initial we already found right here. Okay. And delta T we can find since we are given uh, the total time and the number of steps. So delta T is total time is five seconds and total steps is 100. So that delta T will be 0 0.05 seconds. So that means every step is going to be taking 0 0.05 seconds to go to. Okay. And we're going to go to 100 steps. By the time we, we reach the 100 steps, uh, the hundredth step, then we are at the desired uh, location or transformation desired. All right, so since we have all the required values for these, we can just plug them in. So again, Q initial plus one equals two. This here is my Q initial that was given, or we found this before in previous steps. And then we add to this the velocity, initial velocities of the joints from here. And then we multiply this by delta t, which is 0 0.05, which we found right here. And that gives me these values, which are in units. And the units for the first two elements are radians. And for the third element is in units, length units. For this part of the example, we need to write the linear trajectory function for the Cartesian motion and for the joint motion, both in Cartesian space and in joint space. So let's start with the Cartesian space to find the linear trajectory function for the Cartesian 
linear motion. Uh, my linear motion in the Cartesian space uh, includes x, y, and z. So my current x, y, and z at any time equal to the initial x, y, z plus the velocity of x, y, z multiplied by the time at that particular required time. Okay, so this would be my equation for each one of these, for x and for y and for z. Since I already found the velocities of the Cartesian uh, uh, motion, I can just plug them in here. So that equals to x, y, z initial plus the uh, Cartesian velocities times the time. So I replaced these x dot y dot z dot by their values that we found in an earlier step. I want you to notice here that the Cartesian angular velocities uh, or trajectories uh, are not needed and not required here and simply because we are only controlling x, y and z motion. We are not controlling omega x or omega y or omega z or rotations about x, y and z. So we would not need the trajectory for the rotation uh, for this particular motion in this example. Uh, now if we move on to the joint space, we need to find the linear trajectory function for the joint motion. So again, for the current uh, joint values, theta1, theta2, and d3, to find their function, we need to add the initial theta1, theta2, and d3 to the velocity of theta1, theta2, and d3 multiplied by the time for that particular moment. Okay, so theta1 equals to uh, theta1 current equals to theta1 uh, initial plus theta dot 1 times t, and same for theta2 and same for d3. Now I just want to remind you that we already have uh, the joint velocities and what their values are. So we defined this in an earlier step in the previous slide that joint velocity is equal to the inverse of the Jacobian at time t, because that changes at every time step, multiplied by the Cartesian velocities. Okay, And we already have the Cartesian velocities. So I'm going to plug this uh, j inverse times Cartesian velocities in place of this. Okay, So I'm going to remove this here and replace it by its value. So in this case, the linear joint trajectory function becomes uh, the current value equals to the initial value plus j inverse at the time t. And this has to be evaluated at whatever time that we're looking at, multiplied by these values for Cartesian velocities multiplied by the time at that moment that we're looking at. 